pray a little more. Lord, I, that phrase, how great thou art, and then me able to call you Father, or even first service just got on me. It, it's crazy that uh, I have that kind of access, access to the greatest, the great one. So we worship you for your greatness, and then we thank you for this access, for this ability to be able to call you dad, that this um, work that your son did on the cross so that we could, so we could be close to you. So even this morning, as we, uh, we, we look at your word, we trust you, Father, that you'll deliver your word the way you want it delivered, that it'll, it'll uh, land on our hearts and move us. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's Father's Day. I hope if you didn't know, surprise, you probably got a little work to do if you didn't know. Um, Anybody in the room had become a father in the last five years? Like, you got, you got a little baby in the last five years, anybody? Anybody in the last 10? Last 10 years? All right, all right there we go. We got a few fathers. It's good, good, good. And we got lots of fathers in the room that became a father before that, and so we're praying for y'all young dads right now because, because uh, you took on a lot of responsibility there, but I don't know if you know that, but when uh, Cheryl told me the, for the first time we were pregnant, so our oldest son... Uh, she gave me this card. I don't know what it is about that moment, but I can remember that moment so clearly. I can remember the card. It, it had some brown on it. I don't even know where it was. It, just, it was a brown card. She handed it to me, and I opened it. We're in our little duplex, hardwood floors, and I don't remember what she said, but it was really clear that I was about to be a dad. My first reaction was to drop on my knees on the hardwood floor. I went straight to the floor, and I wrapped my arms around her knees, and I started crying. I don't think exactly the, re the reaction she was looking for at the moment. Like, like it, it, was, it was overwhelming, the weight. I, could, I mean, it was like the weight of the responsibility of being a dad jumped on my shoulders. I just went straight to the floor, and I, I knew I had to get some stuff right. I hadn't been treating Cheryl great. First two years of marriage, we were still trying to figure it out. Here I am going to be a dad. i got to get my act together. It was, it was abundantly clear and, and full of weight. And so young dads in the room, man, I appreciate you. It's, it's a lot of weight. you got your shoulders up under. And we need you. And we need you to finish. we got this little word up here, resilient. You guys are that. Like, like that's part of being a dad is getting back up off the mat. You will get it handed to you on occasion, but then you get back up off the mat and you work again. We're excited for you guys to uh, walk that out. I felt in that moment like, I mean, I had my dad as a picture, and I knew a couple other good dads. Like, can I, am I tough enough to do this? I really had lots of doubt about my ability to deliver as a father. I, do I have enough grit? Do I have the determination? I had all these internal questions about my ability to deliver. I had no idea. The utter joy being a dad would bring. Like I felt the responsibility day one. I did not anticipate carrying that weight of responsibility would produce utter joy for me, which also meant at times it would produce anguish. It, it, it would be both like this, this great joy of investing in these little rascals that I call my kids. And then they could also hurt me in ways I never thought I could be hurt, Right? Sometimes not even directly directed at me. It just, it just hurt. And I, I uh, man, I, I, I deeply desire to finish as a father. I know many of you guys do. There for a while when um, I would question how long I was going to live, I would pray to live to 61. That's my number. Cheryl hates it when I do this. I'm like, if I just make it to 61, I'm like eight years out. The goal, my youngest is... Is 18, and my goal when he was just a little baby was if I could just make it to when he's 25, then, then I could do my job. It's like this great weight on parents and certainly on dads. And so in a room like today, we sit together with folks that have lost a dad in the last little bit. And Father's Day has some, some pain connected to it, it, it uh, because of that loss. And it's really good to do that in community. So some in our room have lost a child. Some dads in the room have lost a child in the last year or two. And so there's that, 
that, that pain that's associated with loss. It's really good to be a part of a family like this and, and do all that together. For some, there's this deep angst that comes on Father's Day because of some disappointments. Whether your father's present or not, there's uh, certainly uh, a variety of things that happen from fathers to their children. And so this day can have, have angst to it. And it's really good, again, to be a part of a community and not isolated, not alone, be able to work some of that stuff out. Through the years, that has been, uh, as, as for me, most of my work has been with men to watch them work through maybe a wound from a father or a lost father is is really important part of development as followers of Jesus. For Father's Day, we're gonna we're gonna work through a passage of scripture. We've been doing a series called Resilient. Resilient means to bounce back. That's a very small, easy definition to grab from it means to bounce back. And we've been telling stories of folks that are resilient. This one certainly seemed to fit on Father's Day. We spent four Sundays on, on a lady named Esther in the Old Testament who was incredibly resilient. And then there's a guy named Stephen who went all the way to the point of being martyred for Christ. And then last week, we, uh, we picked out a guy named Nicodemus. We're going to do this all summer. And this week, I, I got a pretty interesting story uh, where if you, just, if you know the story, he's like uh, a supporting actor. He's not the main person in the story. Matter of fact, this is one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. The, the main character of the story outside of Jesus, you could argue, is the most important figure in the whole Bible. He's certainly in the top 10. I don't know if this happens to your house, but my house, like we, the, the sons debate on LeBron and Jordan to agnose him and drive me nuts. Who's, who's better? And I always, I want to go magic just to go off the board a little bit and just, just drive them crazy. Or, or if you're a Clemson fan, my kids argue whether Deshaun or Trevor, like they're both Clemson players. Like, how can we not just enjoy both of them? And I, so I go Homer Jordan, go back to the 80s just to be like, just a pain. And you know, Homer Jordan couldn't even throw the ball, but we did win. But anyway, there's, a, like, there's these debates. It's just kind of how a lot of us rankings. And this character, this guy named David, man, he is one of the greatest, if not the greatest Israelite leader of all time. Uh, he, probably him or Moses from the Old Testament. Maybe Elijah gets into discussion, but, but, or Abraham. But David is the one every little Jewish boy wants to grow up and be like. David, as a young boy, is playing the harp. Some of y'all don't even know what a harp is. Like it, 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 I won't even try to explain it, but it, it kind of takes a delicate touch based on what I've seen, not experienced. And, and uh, then he was a shepherd, and one day he killed a lion, and one day he killed a bear protecting the sheep. Ha, what? Our world doesn't even allow for this these days, right? Like, like we want to put you in one category or the other, and yet th this guy was all man, and he was all man on both sides. He was all man. Like he wrote 72-ish, some people think 73 of the Psalms in the Old Testament, right? This book of Psalms, 150 chapters, not all written by David, by the way. About half of them were. He was in incredibly creative and artistic, and then... Like, one of the most famous stories in the Bible is when he kills a giant. Like, he throws a rock with a slingshot so hard it embeds in the giant's head. And David enjoys the blood coming out, takes the dude's sword, and removes his head. That's our boy that wrote 72 psalms. So he got, you know, he got a little art. and He got, he got a little warrior. He's, he's both. He's, he's just a stud. And the people of Israel, they loved him. And he loved them. Over the course of time, you can read it. It's 1 Samuel, and it leads into 2 Samuel. By 2 Samuel, he becomes the king, and he is a terrific king. He loves the people. He serves the people. As a matter of fact, at one point in time, he's called a man after God's own heart. So, man, you're talking about Jesus. Obviously, when you read the Bible, you, Jesus, 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 right? Like he's, he's number one ranked in the Bible and probably ought to be ranked number one through 100. But real quick, after Jesus, this guy named David comes on the scene, a man after God's own heart. And then you come to chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. It's tough to read. It starts with when kings normally went out to war. That always just scares me when I read that part of the passage. When kings normally go out to war, 
David stayed in Jerusalem. He got a pretty nice house. It usually works out if you're the king. You got a really nice house. He's got a nice house. All I can imagine, I don't know, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how it's set up, but this balcony, this, this roof that he's probably up on taking a nap. He's taking a nap in the afternoon, fellas in the room. That's a problem in and of itself. Probably not a power nap, probably a lazy nap because he's supposed to be at war. Taking a nap on the roof. Probably got somebody there fanning one of them big fans. At least that's the way the kings usually were. And he, he takes a little walk around the roof, looks out, and guess what he sees? A very attractive lady. And she's taking a bath. For some of y'all that don't understand this, generally when you're taking a bath, you don't have no clothes on. <laughs> That's how it works in my house. And so he sees this very attractive lady, and, and he, not, uh, he doesn't, like, cover his eyes and go, I need to go to the other side. He focuses in and then uh, proceeds to try to figure out who she is. If you know the story, her name's Bathsheba. He finds that out and finds out that she's the wife of one of his best guys. The scripture calls him the mighty man. His name was Uriah, and Uriah would put his life on the line to protect David. He's one of his very best men. But what David saw on the roof trumped his allegiance to one of his very best men. And you'll see as you read the passage, it's difficult to read. It always pains me to read this chapter because this is the dude. David's the dude. David brings Uriah back from battle. Because Uriah is where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be in battle in the spring. He brings him back. He tries to get him drunk. He tries to get him to go sleep with Bathsheba. If you've watched any soap operas over the course of your life, what's he trying to do? He's trying to make it look like Uriah is the daddy. Uriah is too noble of a man. He feels connected to his, his fellow uh, folks, at men at war, and so he won't go in and sleep with his wife. He doesn't want to participate in the joys of the world, so he sleeps out on the porch, right? He will not go in, and he works his way back to battle. And if you remember this story, it gets so ugly. Uh, David actually sends a note with Uriah to Joab, the general, and says to Joab, hey, I want you guys to push up in battle against, they've got a, a, a city under siege. I want you to push up, and I want you then to retreat and I want you to leave Uriah up there by himself. What's that mean? Certain death. And, and when you really read the passage, it gets even uglier because it, it's more like you leave Uriah, one of the mighty men, up at the front with his platoon. So it's not like, I mean, kind of hard to talk a guy into just running up and attacking the city all by himself, right? Like, no, I want your platoon to stay up here and get it done. And what happens? All, all of them die, and we know Uriah dies, according to the scriptures. And then uh, David brings Bathsheba into the house. Bathsheba has a baby. It's his baby. And it kind of goes quiet. Anybody else bothered by this? Man after God's own heart. I mean, he, he, he broke half the Ten Commandments. He's killing. He's uh, 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 adulteries in the mix. He's, he's lying. He's covering. He's got all that stuff going on. Is he still God, a man after God's own heart? I want you to just stew on a little bit. Because we live in a world right now that uh, wants to deny that that seed is inside of us, the same seed that was in David, wants to say that I would never do that, right? There's this desire to say that I would be or we would be or our elite culture or idealism is too good to commit those kind of atrocities. Well, we've tried it with politics, right? So... The left produced Hitler, and the right produced Stalin. I'm not betting on either one of them to fix this thing. There's clearly that seed inside of those idealisms that lands inside of men that would put themselves above all others. Man, even in the church, we do it a little bit. If you grew up Wesleyan, when somebody does something like David says, you'd say he lost his salvation. If you grew up Presbyterian, you might say something like he was never saved. 
Right? Like we, we, we protect ourselves because we do not want to be associated with somebody that comes off the rails and produces such horror, like taking not only the man's life, but the men in his platoon's life to cover his sexual encounter with the guy's wife. And yet, the scripture says over and over, and when you read the New Testament, that everybody in this room was born into sin. Everybody's a sinner. So it ought to take all the self-righteousness out. Real hard to point across the room or point across the aisle or, or, or point at other people and say, I'm better than you, because our Bible actually says, no, you, you're all sinners, and yet there's this deep-seated thing inside of us that competes and compares and tries to be a little bit better than the other person as if to be righteous. When our whole story, the gospel says that we weren't righteous, that we needed somebody to make us righteous. So when we read the story, and we're going to get to the punchline here in a minute, I just want to remind you that you are a sinner. This is my. And uh, that ain't going away. And Galatians says, even after you believe, your flesh wars for self. I don't know if you guys can feel this in your insides. I can feel it in mine. You, myself wants to elevate me at all costs. And so potentially, as David does this day, he looks across and he wants what he wants, and he's going to take it at all costs. That seeds in him, and it gets away, and it produces something horrible. Now, Galatians also says that the Holy Spirit indwells us, and if you're a believer in Jesus, you've been dwelled by the Holy Spirit, and so there's a war going on on your insides. So it's less possible to allow that seed inside of you to produce the horrors that it can because there's this war going on. But if, this, if you allow your heart to become hardened, then it's possible for all sorts of things to happen. There's so much great accountability by just agreeing with the truth of the, of the Bible that says that we are all sinners, that we are totally depraved. And so Keller, quoting somebody else, said this week, he said, you either need to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. <laughs> really interesting quote. And so we come to uh, chapter 12, and we're introduced to this resilient friend of David's uh, named Nathan. And when I think about killing sin or it'll be killing you, I, I think about my relationship with God, but then I think about my relationship with friends and how they serve me in that way. Check this out. Here's our, our, our boy Nathan. So the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. It's going to make you mad. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. All right, I'm going to tell, tell you this story. It's going to make you mad. One, one was rich and one was poor. And the rich man owned great many sheep and cattle, and the poor man owned nothing but a little lamb that he had bought. He raised the little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. You got the picture in your mind? I'm not like an animal lover, so this kind of grosses me out, but this dude loves this lamb. He's holding him like I hold my grandbaby girls. And <laughs> this lamb's eating out of his plate. He cuddled in his own arms like a baby daughter in verse 4. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for the guest. Anybody else ready to go to the rich man's house? I'm ready. You going to go with me? Let's go get him. And David was. Verse 5. David was furious. As surely you can imagine him pounding the table and and just so you know, Nathan knows exactly what he's doing. He's speaking, he's speaking to the judge of all of Israel. Back in the day, you didn't have, like, the president and Supreme Court and Congress. You had the king, the king, and the king. So, so Nathan's coming to him like he's the Supreme Court. He wants a final judgment on this story that he's made up. And so in front of David, he's, he's conjuring up all these emotions from the judge. He's asking David to be the judge. And Jay, David is furious. You can imagine him pounding the table and saying, Surely as the Lord lives, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Kill him. Yeah, it's a little overstatement, right? Like you, 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 Capital punishment doesn't exactly fit with stealing my dog. 
But in this case, David is so irate. I wonder, wonder why. You ever get like extra righteous when you got some stuff in the dark? Like, like your righteousness kind of bubbles up to the, to the top and you condemn others when you, you got this stuff kind of hidden in, in the darkness of your heart. I don't know. That perhaps that's what happens. And then he, he actually slows down and he reverts to the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, actually, verse 6, he must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one that he stole and for having no pity. So he owes him four lambs. So pay him back with the four lambs. That would be actually according to what the law demanded. So as a judge, he acts out. And then Nathan, I imagine him making eye, eye contact. If you've ever had this done to you, it's not pleasant. He says, uh, you are the man. I told that story about you. And David has to just sit in it. You, I, I, I picture Nathan, when I was a young man, I pictured, pictured Nathan standing up and saying, really, you are the man. Like kind of, I don't know, it feels more bravado like I'm being a man by saying it loud. I, I picture him saying it really harshly to David. It's like Maybe David's going to start crying because he says it so loud. Doesn't, doesn't really. The more I read it, the way he told that story, it seems like it actually, I imagine him saying, David, but what, what were you thinking? That story's about you. You're the man. You're the man in the story. You're the one that stole from Uriah. You can feel the pain as he loves David and delivers this bad news to really a dear friend. There's a lot to learn from uh, Nathan in this story, and I just want us to learn a couple thoughts real quick. Uh, his love gave him the courage to tell the last 10%. You ever have somebody kind of, <laughs> or you do it, you want to tell somebody the truth, and you kind of get 90% of the way, and that last 10%, you know that's going to sting. And so you kind of bail before you get to the end. Nathan's going to push right through 90%. He's going to hit 100. He's going to... David probably felt like he went about 150 on him. He, he's going to give him the whole truth, but he's going to do it in the right tone. And he's going to stay after he gives it. So let's just look at that. The last 10%. Uh, our culture right now would have us do anything but tell our ten friends the truth. It is, it is built on lying to one another. So we constantly are telling our kids and our friends, that they're great. They tell us a story that we totally know is good, or run them into the ditch, and we smile and nod and encourage them. There's, there's no room in our culture to uh, tell somebody the truth that would go contrary to what they're saying. That you actually, man, watching some of the shows on TV that are competitions and listening to the judges, it just, I want to throw up. I'm like, that ain't true. She can't sing. Why are you telling us she can sing? I can't sing. I know she can't sing. Don't tell her she's, you know, like, anyway, it drives, it drives me nuts. And we do, we do it with kids' sports. We do it with all kind of stuff. Everybody's the MVP. I'm like, no, he ain't the MVP. He can't make a layup. I'm glad he's on the team. But, like, we don't, it, it is out of control. There's no truth. So nobody can, it's very difficult to have direction if nobody will tell you the truth. You actually got to answer some questions eventually. So, so here's what happens. You go to the cubicle at work, and you tell a story about your husband. The feedback, if you're whining, is going to be in full agreement. It's going to be the worst counsel you could possibly get. Because they're more concerned about you liking them than you. If you're a dad in a room, and, and, and you, you complain about, being a dad or, or you put yourself in a position where you, you're always around dudes that tell you how great you are at that, you probably just are going to underachieve at this job called fatherhood. Eventually, man, if you really want to be great at this, being a dad or at your job or at following Jesus, you're going to have to have a couple people around you to tell you the truth. My, my experience is I have to give people permission People don't just walk up to me and say, John, you stink at blank, right? Like, I have to go, hey, do you think I can sing? And, and Cheryl, real quickly, like, no, you can't sing. I'll do singing for a thing. 
Is he going to tell me the truth? And it's really helpful if somebody, if I have friends that'll tell me the truth. And dad's in the room like, a great exercise a day is ask somebody that loves you, how am I doing as a dad? Like, you're going, I don't want to know. <laughs> Why not? Because clearly you love your kids. Like, you love them. You want the best for them. So why not get somebody who is good at this to give you some counsel on it? Very difficult to want to hear the truth. David, for as, as horrendous as this event is in his life, he's built this system where he has people around him that will tell the truth, which is crazy for a king. If you look back just a little bit, Nathan in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel is going to tell him the truth about something else. And David receives it and responds to it. He built it so that he'd have people around him that would tell him the truth. And it's right here, though he's just about destroyed his life and his lineage, Nathan telling the truth is going to save his tail and give him a chance to repent. So it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. I want it for you. One of my sons really uh, came off the rails as far as following the Lord. And... Uh, one of the very first things I did was tell our elders here at Radius. Oh, man, why well, stand up under that all by myself? I want to know what they thought. I want them to pray with me for that. And then I called this old mentor. It's in his 70s. If you're in your 70s, I just called you old. No problem. People call me old all the time. Uh, and on the phone, I just, in pain, because you're desperate when your kid's struggling. He, uh, he just walked me through it. He loved me, but shot me straight, told me how I needed to carry myself as a dad during this season. And uh, then we talked about it. I just asked him questions. What did I do wrong? Processed all that. It was, it was hard, but it was great to have somebody that loves me and that I trust that I knew would tell me the truth. One of the things that you see in this particular story is not just that the truth is told and that permission is given, but the tone in which the truth is told. It's amazing. Why do you think Nathan told that story? Because he loved David. He wanted to disarm him. He wanted to move him to repentance. He, he went through all this activity. He didn't, you, like a lot of times you imagine somebody coming in the door. How in the world you could do this? No problem being angry, but I want to disarm my best friends. I want to disarm them so that I can get to the truth because I want to move them to repentance. Sometimes we're so excited about telling the truth that we think the truth is going to bring God glory. The reality is that repentance brings God more glory. He tells the truth in love to move us to repentance. He wants the whole world to repent and believe in his son, Jesus. And, and so for our best friends, when we're being like Jesus, we're, we're telling them the truth. We actually got to get there. We got to get the last 10% out. But it's, it's on purpose. It's done with a tone of humility because we want to move them and get them to a place of change. John 3.17, it uh, doesn't get quite the play that 3.16 does. But it's a great verse. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but save the world through him. So we learn in other passages that, that the law was given, that the last 10% was given so that we could see a need. But Jesus came to move us to repentance so that he could save us. And that is our job on this planet with one another. To love each other enough to tell the truth, but but do it in the right tone. By the way, this never happens on Facebook or Instagram. Now, you confront people on Facebook or Instagram, you a coward. I'm sorry. I'm putting it straight out there for you. Like, that's so cowardice, it's laughable. Oh, boy, I wrote something on there. I'm like, do you really? Because I ain't, no, ain't nobody care. Uh, the only way to love somebody and tell them the truth is, is not face, it's face to face. It's the, and don't call it like face to face. Because when, when you look at somebody face to face, there's a humility that comes because you know your own weakness. You can't hide behind a screen. Now they're looking at you. And one of the scariest part about telling somebody else the truth that you love is they know the truth about you. Right? And so there's this instant accountability when you look at each other that is just so healthy. I was on a retreat. We've been married. I'm embarrassed to tell you this story. 
married uh, maybe 10 years. Cheryl and I were struggling. I've told that story before. But I'm on retreat with a friend. He was a friend that, that followed me. He's younger than me. And so I would lead him spiritually in some ways. He'd probably call me a mentor. And uh, for whatever reason, I was being knucklehead, and I was complaining about Cheryl. And uh, kind of a whiny kind of a way. I know none of y'all have ever done that, but I was. And this younger guy, I won't name him, but he, he's looking at me and listening, and he will not agree with me. Now, he, you know, he's probably I'm older, a little intimidated, so he didn't say anything. He didn't say, you shouldn't be saying this. He didn't say, you know, you're a loser for talking like that. He just looked me straight in the eyes, and he just wouldn't give me any body language that would say that he even felt bad for me. He was disagreeing with me with his body language. He didn't need to say anything. His tone was perfect. The more I watched him, I was like, I need to shut up. I'm just digging a hole right. He loved me enough not to agree with me. You need that. You need people in your life that love you enough not to agree with you. As a matter of fact, the people that love you the most will tell you the truth. Pretty cool passage in Ephesians. It's written to dads. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. But bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's a really interesting passage when you think about truth because dads, like a big part of our job in the home is to hold up truth. <laughs> There's this constant conversation about what's the truth because we're training all these rascals in the house on, on what the truth is, and there's usually tons of correction, so there's lots of discipline, but I'm not supposed to pro provoke them to anger. So I'm supposed to bring discipline without provoking them to anger. That seems pretty complicated. It seems like we're going to need some help. And the help starts, as it did with Nathan, by being sent from the Lord, by walking with the Lord. It's helped by David giving him permission to speak in. And so that friendship really gives him this place to speak in ways that nobody else can speak. What I love the most about Nathan that I had never paid attention to before is he finished. So if you read this, he tells the last 10%. I'll just read it to you real quick before we quit. Last 10%, Nathan said to David, you're the man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and, and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives, his kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had been enough, if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you've murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. So he finishes with the last 10% there. You flip over to verse 13. David confessed to Nathan. He breaks. He confesses. Who's he say he confesses to? The Lord? It starts with his friend, his counselor. He confessed to Nathan. He'll confess to the Lord here. He writes a psalm about it. David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And he owns it. And if you keep reading the book, by the very end of 2 Samuel, David is going to pass on his ring, his king ring. He's going to pass along the kingship to his son. And you know who's going to be there to anoint his son the king? Our boy Nathan. He's still there. He ain't going anywhere. There's, it's it's incredible to re receive the truth from a friend that you know isn't going to leave. It brings uh, a level of peace to deal with my failure like, like no other. Nathan, Nathan, he finishes. I used to say this about my dad. Um, dad, like, not a whole lot of hugs, not a whole lot of I'm proud of you, but he ain't going nowhere. There's a lot of trust just in that one thing. And that is who the Father in heaven is. He's perfect that way. We as, as human dads, we just aren't. We, we can't necessarily even live our whole lives. And we fall apart on all variety of ways. But the God, the, our Father, consistently always there. In this case, a good, truthful man finishes. And this boy named Solomon of David... He's going to be the son of Bathsheba, 
the one that he saw off the roof that horrible day, the one who killed, like God brings all this redemption through her womb after all that chaos. And guess who wrote this verse, Proverbs 27? David's son, Solomon. Here's what it says. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of the enemy. On Father's Day, man, you want to be a good dad? It probably should be obvious. You're at church. <laughs> that means we're going to talk about God and, and walking with God. I can't give you better advice than that to be a good dad. But secondly, finding and giving permission to someone to tell you the truth about your character, even about how you're parenting. You're probably going to have to go. My name's John, so I'll make fun of my name. Johnny, Johnny, you got to tell me, like, like, am I doing this right? You're probably just going to have to flat out ask. To give somebody permission to tell you the truth. The Bible says um, the best friends will tell you the truth. As a matter of fact, the very best friends will even give up their life for you. And we, we, we celebrate that every Sunday. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So Jesus would not only tell us the truth. When the truth was told and the truth about me is that I'm a sinner and I have no business calling his father my daddy. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the truth, and you can't meet the standard of the truth, so I'll give my life for it, and I'll make you righteous. You're not righteous. I'm going to tell you. He told me. He told a lot of y'all. I'm, I'm not righteous. I'm a sinner, and so I'll give my life for you. So that, so that you could be righteous. So when you see these folks coming up here, you know them, right? There's going to be people walking up here taking bread and juice. And you know their life. and Some of y'all married to them, right? Like, like you know exactly who they are. They're walking up here as righteous no matter what happened this week because that sin has been paid for by the blood and body of Jesus Christ. That's why we celebrate on Sundays. We celebrate the death because of the goodness of God. Let's pray together.